Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, FUSE Research Programme meeting uh, that in, in co-hosted with the Centre for, for Partnering, which looks at the, the future of commissioning of public health services in local government, the particular relational approach to collaboration and partnership. Um, my name is Peter Vandergraaf. I'm the FUSE Knowledge Exchange Broker. Um, and uh, there's a few other partners involved that inter will introduce themselves as, as we go along. We've got an exciting program for you this morning uh, with a number of speakers um, to outline sort of the, 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 the center itself. And uh, so if, give a bit of background to this few uh, signed a memorandum of understanding in December uh, last year with the Center for Partnering because we felt there was a, a natural affinity in terms of the aims of both FUSE and, and the Center for, for, for Partnering, um, supporting the partnering agenda, which is central to, to public policy and, and service delivery. Uh, and, and the Center really aims sort of bring those partners together from third sector industry and, and academia to support that agenda. And also for FUSE, uh, partnering is, is a major plank of our translational research program. So we felt this would be a very opportune uh, moment to, to bring both organizations together and explore opportunities for collaborative working and mm -hmm. research and that's what the the meeting today is about really to uh, showcase some of the work of both the center for partnering and and fuse and have a discussion amongst ourselves what opportunities we see to deliver collaborative uh, projects and, and 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 research opportunities um can you do the next slide please adrian so we, we have a bit of an agenda where we've got a few uh, speakers we've got um starting with professor adrian who, who will talk about local authority and the social determinants of health, particularly from a relational approach perspective. Um, then we have Joyce Little and John Schott uh, talking about a more regional perspective to the use of relationalism and the leveling up agenda, uh, followed by uh, Richard Simmons, who will provide a more research exemplar with a focus on public health on, on the set of partnering relationship, relationalism approach. We then provide you with a little break after all those those uh, talks and, and, and presentations. Um, and then I will pick up the discussion after the break to uh, share a few reflections from FUSE working in this area and working collaboratively with local government and where we see this developing next. At that point, we would really like to open the floor to everyone to get your ideas on how we can further this opportunities are there uh, and we hope to come up at the end of the meeting with a summary of, of useful action points to take forward uh, finishing at 12 so um, everybody can can have lunch hopefully so we will hope we we'll look forward to, to an exciting meeting um, and at this point uh, sorry next slide please Adrian uh, there's a few uh, rules of engagement I would quickly like to reiterate um, because this is a, an online meeting please when people ask us the, the speakers are doing their presentations I would kindly ask you to Put your microphones off or mute them uh, so there's no disturbing background noises um, also please stop your own video because it helps with the streaming video but we really encourage you to put your video on uh, when we go to the uh, discussion interactive bit because it's always nice to see faces when you're having discussions and, and conversations if you have any questions feel free to put them in the the, the chat box uh, or, or uh, put your hand up or a question but they're doing the q a session and we'll try to field those during the the, the, the discussion um, it goes without saying that we, we expect everyone to behave professionally, um, and, and I'm sure you all will, uh, but if you feel that someone is behaving inappropriate or, or if there's a cause for concern, please message uh, Cheryl or Wiscombe and we'll, we'll deal with it uh, accordingly, um, but of course everything will, will, will be fine. Um, at this stage, I think um, it, I'll, I will hand over to Adrian Bonner, who... Um, Yes. Or oh, Professor Richard Smith, sorry, he, he's the, 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 the chair uh, for, for the Centre for Partnering and will introduce himself uh, and, and his colleagues. Richard, would you like to? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very, very much for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of time. So mm -hmm. the, the couple of things I'd just like to say, first of all, um, that I, we have put together some slides um, in the introduction. Uh, I won't be able to obviously address all the issues that, that, that are within those slides or contained within those slides, but I certainly would like to answer questions or discuss them in a little bit more detail uh, when we get to the question and answer uh, session. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, as, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm Richard Smith. Um, I set up the Centre of Partnering with a, a number of other people a couple of years ago. Uh, and in particular uh, with Stirling University um, uh, that I am uh, a professor of. 
Um, and, and the objective of setting up the Centre for Partnering was to, as it suggests, do something with the idea of bringing public, private and third sectors together in a more efficient uh, and perhaps more effective way. Uh, and we want to do that through the introduction of the thing we called uh, relationalism. Um, so um, just lastly, by way of introduction, my background is um, I'm a barrister by profession, but <clears throat> I've been crossing the border between public and private sector for some 40 years now. Uh, and I particularly had experience uh, as a chief officer in Portsmouth City Council. And then over the last uh, decade or more, uh, I founded um, a, a property group, which was um, set up on the basis of relational contracting. And I'm very happy to, to talk about that at some point later. So uh, very quickly, I'll canter through these um, introductory slides, if I may. Um, uh, the, the next slide, please. So this is very much <clears throat> just to just to point out, um, and we're very, very happy about this. Uh, the Centre for Partnering and FUSE uh, have signed a, a memorandum of understanding, very high level, high level document, and, and really goes to um, suggest that we might work together on collaborative activities, um, particularly related to our common aims, if we move on. Uh, within this MOU, we, we talk about um, setting up uh, some sort of relationship uh, which is concerned with joint development delivery of research projects. And we'll spend some time today talking about what those research projects might be. Um, and moving on again, um, by way of the uh, MOU, I just highlighted there that we wanted to set up some sort of project team together with nominations or representatives from each of the um, FUSE universities or groups. Um, and we would like to suggest to you how that might be integrated within the Centre for Partnering um, so we become a joint organisation. And, and I would like to understand how what we're suggesting could integrate with, 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 with FUSE. What does relationalism mean to us? Um, well, it's the development of long-term sustainable partnering, uh, but with a culture of equals. We talk much about contractor-client relationships um, and, and not as much as I would like to see in the context of genuine partnerships. That's partnerships across the board, creating the opportunity, uh, selecting, appointing and delivering the opportunity together uh, as equals. Um, so what are we in a nutshell? Uh, five universities came together um, that it, they are uh, Stirling, Northumbria, Manchester, Met, uh, Oxford University and Cardiff. Um, and, and we work together uh, as an organization and we have created our own governance framework through which these universities cooperate. And you will see it's based upon five pillars, you know, our purpose, our program, our partners, our product that we're trying to uh, evolve, which is very much around um, a knowledge base. Uh, and then what is our policy? Um, and this slide is only important to the extent of showing you that we are a number of groups that meet between uh, meet monthly, generally monthly. Um, and uh, we are uh, at the moment uh, focused on third sector interests, private and, and public interests, but within, within a regionalism context and, and particularly a regionalism context uh, like the Northeast and um, North and Northeast and, and, and um, Professor Joyce Little and, and Professor John Shutt will be talking uh, more about that aspect a little bit later. But you see at the bottom, we would very much like, uh, with, your, with your agreement, to set up a, a public health group that could interrelate with our other groups and be part of our process. Um, and of course, I need to understand how that public health group fits into your objectives and, and, and marries up with, with the way you're organized. So there's a mutuality there that we need to consider. And then moving on again, um, Adrian Bonner will be talking, Professor Bonner from Sterling will be talking about that, so I'm going to pass through that quickly. Um, and now, this is a, a really important thing for us <coughs> in the centre. Uh, we, we are wanting to prove um, what we mean by relationalism. So we want to uh, establish a, a definition. Um, so people were quite clear when we talk about relationalism, what it means. But most importantly, we want to show that by acting in a relational way, you, you create a benefit, a dividend, 
and that that dividend extends to both a social value context and a commercial value. And, and again, we can come back to talking about that a little bit later. Um, this is our, our, our first um, uh, exemplar, which again, we can explain, but it has, uh, we are at the moment organizing what we call our contractor related function that's largely driven by the private sector alongside our public sector interest, which is driven by the client function. And, and we're trying to engage the third sector into that debate and discussion. So at the end of it, we'll study these exemplars uh, and we'll learn from them. And we should hopefully come out the other end with being able to demonstrate the dividend and, and the knowledge. If I move on, if I move on from there. So um, again, this is a matrix we've created. Um, at the end of the day, what are we trying to achieve? Well. Once we've defined it, once we've measured the impact of it, both socially and, and, and uh, um, commercially, we need to look at its context in the context of that from, from the well being of the community. Uh, and so that's an environmental, <laughs> social, cultural, and financial perspective. And what we're beginning to do, and that's only by way of illustration, we're beginning to, uh, to, 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 to fill that up, fill that matrix up uh, with the sorts of issues that we need to address. And then we move on to the next slide which is where I'm going to end because I'm conscious um, we need to keep to time. Um, so so how, do we, how do we go about doing all of this? Um, well, we are ostensibly a facilitating organisation, but, but in, a, in, in a way, Centre for Partnering is, is a commissioning organisation. It's commissioning, almost in a way procuring, in inverted commas, uh, the idea of relationalism. Uh, and, and then translating that through our governance structure, through our incubation processes, where we take an idea, incubate it, and consider what impact that idea could have in practical consequences. So we, I, we take ideas, we innovate, we consider the impact, and we create that knowledge base. And we're partway now into the creation of that knowledge base, uh, supported by a Concord app that, makes, uh, that is a definition of the parameters, of relationalism and it leads us on to our objective of creating accreditation tools through understanding and developing exemplars how we can um, hopefully introduce new ideas new thinking into that whole partnering debate uh, and if we get it all right there will be a relational dividend um, uh, i think that's my last slide isn't it yes. so um, um, for, yeah. forgive me for cantering through that fairly quickly um, and I know we'll come back to questions and answers. So uh, if I may pass on to Professor uh, Bonner. Yeah, well, pleased to meet everybody around the screen, although I can only see little strips of you. Uh, and thank you to Peter for uh, enabling this uh, joint session. I I'll be very brief and focus on the middle one of these uh, books, which is part of our uh, policy press uh, series on social determinants of health. Um, I actually come from a neuroscience background, and so for many years I've been looking at uh, alcohol in the brain, um, uh, health inequalities, and then more uh, social policy recently. So, um, so the, the blue one there uh, was actually focusing on social inequality and well-being with a number of contributions from uh, key people, uh, focusing on things like um, the uh, inequalities, gender, and people who you may, may know, such as Claire Bambra, uh, I did chapters on geopolitical dimensions of this. But all of that work began to focus on the central role of local authorities uh, in funding or not funding uh, issues which uh, impacted on social determinants. So just very briefly, um, this book here, um, I've shown you the back cover because there's a, a very nice comment from uh, Sir Michael Marmont who talked about um, reducing health inequalities requires action in local government on the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. So that was uh, a very nice comment. Uh, and within this book, we've got some key commentators um, you might know of um, Professor Harry Burns, who in the first part talked about deaths of despair, uh, and then a section by, um, again, somebody who you would know, um, uh, Professor, Professor David Hunter, uh, an evaluation of health and well-being boards, and then uh, a chapter on um, health and social uh, systems from the, the Manchester group led by um, Dr. Coleman. But briefly, uh, I wanted to focus on just 
two or three chapters in the second part of the book, uh, this one here being from the Association for the Directors of Public Health. And I should point out that a lot of this work was carried out uh, towards the end of 2019, uh, where, for instance, the, um, uh, the association directors and the other public health people coming up in a moment were highlighting the huge reduction in finance uh, for running public health systems. Uh, and also this changing from NHS to local authority uh, management. And basically uh, what uh, the, the association and uh, people coming up, such as um, Edward Kanunga, uh, Gillian Gibson, um, Directors of Public Health in your area, Sunderland and Middlesbrough at that time for Edward. Um, they were drawing attention to this huge depletion of funds to carry out what they should be doing. Little did we know that round the corner uh, was COVID. And so the last part of preparation of the book was carried out during COVID. And it was really fascinating to see uh, these very busy directors of public health still finding time to contribute to this book. You see from this picture that um, uh, in Sunderland, they had drawn up uh, an inequalities framework, which was sort of based upon the um, social determinants of health rainbow model, but it's their interpretation of that. Uh, Edward and Gillian provided some very detailed um, statistics showing the lowered life expectancy in Sunderland and Middlesbrough uh, compared to other parts of the country. So there, that did focus our attention on um, the particular needs in the Northeast. Uh, chapter eight in the book uh, comes from Wigan, and the Kate Arden, the Director of Public Health of Wigan, and the uh, Keith, uh, a lead counsellor there, and Penny Cook from the uh, University of uh, Salford, uh, focused on the, um, the Wigan deal, which some of you will know about. And um, this is really a major cultural change in working with the community and identifying ways by which the huge shortfalls in finance could be addressed by really good partnership consultative working with the local community. And so uh, <clears throat> this was produced when the, our book was published last uh, October. Uh, aspirations for the uh, savings in 2020, 2000, I have no idea what those are, but I guess it, the savings are nothing like uh, what they're presenting here. But the, the Wigan story is quite interesting one in terms of um, place-based approaches, community uh, engagement and partnerships. Now, this chapter is actually from my local community, from the London Borough of Sutton, uh, where, again, faced with huge deficits in um, government funding for local authority activities, um, this um, local authority decided to use a, a com an outcome commissioning approach focusing on four areas, being active, making informed choices, living well, keeping... And so all of the... Uh, previous commissioning work began to focus on these, these key areas to develop um, smarter ways of working. Now, um, I've got a clearly uh, a bit of a personal connection here because I live in this area. And I just wanted, with your permission, to share a personal view because in the high street in the, is this very large mall, St. Nicholas Center, which at the time of writing, shops were closing down, top shot had disappeared. Um, the um, Debenhams was wavering and then we, two or three weeks ago it was closed and mother care uh, went out of business. But focusing on uh, a chapter by my son on the young people issues in this area, a community-based approach fits into the third sector part of this book, which we're talking about. So in a nutshell, um, Adam, uh, who was a previous director of a disability charity, working with his uh, wife, set up SCD, Sutton Community Dance. They crowdfunded the um, development of four large studios in the redundant mother care uh, shop. And this was seen as a great step forward. Uh, started up in 2000, um, 2019 operating with almost 1500 members and very great sense of community because it's all ages, uh, inclusivity, people with learning dis disabilities and a great connection, working really, really well. But then March 2020, the whole thing collapsed when the um, lockdown occurred, all the centre was closed. And so they, we really are uh, in a very big sort of personal uh, commitment here to 
help? How do we cope with the future? Well, what they did was to actually set up a studio in their own garden and with very good agile business techniques and high technology, they actually maintained most of those members during the lockdown period. And so um, this was, I think, due to the relational activities uh, of the, the, the team working personally, relationally with the people, and they held them. And so when they went back to business in the St. Nicholas Centres two weeks ago, it was almost back to where they were, admittedly with very large bills, and uh, so it, it really was a very difficult year for them. But that's, I present that as an example of relation, uh, relationalism actually steering through um, what was a very early business venture uh, to hopefully a bright future as the council begins to look at recreating the high street. Um, Debenhams has gone, um, the, the whole centre has now been sold by the Australian owners and that, that's moving on. So I really wanted to say that um, we can cope with Zoom meetings, but clearly face-to-face -face matters and we do need to address the, uh, the, the local council approaches to uh, re-establishing high streets and those things. So um, in the third book there, Wicked Issues, we're beginning to focus on um, uh, uh, discussions within CFP and this book here, which is well developed, uh, has a number of contributions from people <coughs> like Boyce and John and others. So that's coming up soon. Uh, that's well developed. Uh, we're now putting the foundations of the, the next one, which will be looking at the drivers of change of rela relationism. So I've just galloped through that. I've lost track of the time, but uh, just to refocus on Richard's earlier slide, we are beginning to use these third sector local government examples to um, develop examples, exemplars. So over to Joyce and John. Thank you, Adrian. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, myself and John work in Newcastle Business School at Northumbria, and we've been involved with uh, the Centre for Partnership since its inception. And uh, I've been in uh, New Northumbria for about three years, and John joined me about two years ago to build up the public sector component. We now have a very large number of people in the business school working on public sector issues. We're both specialists in uh, regional and local government and leadership. Next one, please. So I'm just going to take you through our terms of reference and then John will speak um, <clears throat> after me and he'll give you more detail about the, the, the research that we're involved in, and particularly about levelling up. Um, the terms of reference then are looking at various partnership issues raised by the, the research groups um, within the Centre for Partnership particularly focused on the region and particularly the northeast region and how um, higher education and uh, further education are, are, are sort of impacting on that. Obviously the universities are taking a much higher role now <clears throat> in terms of place leadership. Um, how various partnership issues have been uh, are impacting and delivering social and public value. Um, I'll, I'll speak shortly about uh, something I've just had a piece of it as well. Uh, the impact of relationalism within a partnering contract framework, taking account of the need to balance public, private, commercial and third sector uh, interests. Uh, obviously, because we're interested in local government in particular and regional government, we're interested in the way <clears throat> local government and the NHS are working together. And the ultimate aim, obviously, is to um, improve the, uh, the impacts in terms of um, health uh, and local um, and social policy. Um, the partnering infrastructure and whether it's uh, effective and fit for purpose in terms of delivering effective partnership outcomes. And as you all know, you don't need me to tell you, levelling up is the current, uh, uh, you know, hot potato, the, the current uh, policy agenda at the moment. And one of the issues we have, uh, John and I, and we'll speak about it later, is the fact that um, pol government policy from the centre has been very much um, determined by a kind of economic model. Uh, which has ignored the social elements of that. So we're interested in aligning the two. And uh, the, the economic and social impact of unemployment and its effect on young people across the region as well. There are many, many social policy issues um, that we're, we're interested in, as I'm sure everyone confuses too. Next one, please. Um, you don't need me to tell you that um, uh, inequalities have, um, have, have since 2015, uh, areas in the northeast are more unequal, more deprivation, and you can see there that Middlesbrough is now in the top five, and Hartlepool is in the top ten. So inequality is getting worse, and therefore 
uh, there's a need for us to address many of the, the issues uh, related to that. Next one, please. Um, so just a, a few of the, the things that we've been working on. Um, John and I had a book out in 2019 called The Northeast After Brexit. And, uh, we, this was to showcase uh, many of our colleagues in Newcastle Business School uh, and the kind of work that we're doing across the region. I've just had um, a, a, a um, contribution to the International Encyclopedia of Civil Society, looking at um, social value and the importance of social value and public value. And I'm working with a colleague down in Tees in uh, policing Gareth Adile, and uh, we, we, we had a book out last year on public management and vulnerability, and where we both um, aligned our various scholarships in uh, policing and in uh, uh, public management. Um, and I'm going to hand over to John now, who's going to tell you a little bit more about um, some of the work that we've been doing in, in more depth. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think it's probably important to stress that both Joyce and I have got sort of a practitioner's background as well as as well as sort of being academic. So Joyce worked in the civil service. I worked um, in Birmingham and Sheffield city councils in chief executive department. We've, we've got a kind of long sort of history and knowledge of working with the local authorities. Uh, and I set up CLES with Michael Ward and although that was a long time ago, um, it's still going strong after 40 years. So, uh, and that's based in Manchester. So just so that you know some of that background, I think um, what I want to say sort of focused around around the things Joyce has just hinted at, that um, things are really disjointed and fragmented and they're getting worse. And we see no sort of um, sign that people are concerned in central government about these, these sort of issues. There's a lack of concern about research and using sort of evidence-based research in many quarters. And again, I think we should talk about some of these things. We've been trying to sort of, our own research, which we can see here on this slide, um, has been focused a lot on trying to work with the new combined authorities and to look at how to sort of strengthen the role of the combined authorities. Now we're still waiting for the devolution bill which keeps getting postponed and the question is you know how many co more combined authorities are we going to get and what is their capability now there's a, a huge reduction in capacity and focus inside local government and they're very preoccupied you've only got to talk to them at the moment about the difficulty you know, every day there's something else that they're required to bid for in terms of resources and often quite small amounts of money, um, but which which take up a lot of time and a lot of officer time. Um, so uh, there's a worry about that and a worry about how to work with the anchor organizations and focus, you know, the policy and evidence side of things and what the resources are for that. Um, so Joyce and I have been sort of trying to focus on both looking at central local relations and you know, we've just seen a new secondment into the cabinet office and uh, into into D DCLG, a, a focus on levelling up, um, which you've got to be quite sceptical about uh, whether or not this is going to produce anything serious uh, in terms of the, the situation facing the country. And um, you've only got to listen to Dominic Cummings yesterday about the kind of chaos uh, in the centre. And that's, again, something that Joyce and I have been worried about within the cabinet office, the lack of focus on the key strategic issues and linking up economic and social policy and environmental policy and what needs to be done. And I think, you know, to come back to the combined authorities, which is of interest to Fuse, you know, not many of the combined authorities have got a health remit, Don't really only Manchester, although Birmingham has also uh, had some interest in these issues, but a lot of the combined authorities in the north uh, have got no sort of focus on these joined up issues. So we need to be thinking and looking uh, at what kind of research needs doing. And that's why uh, we welcome this debate with FUSE. Thank you. Um, we can, yeah, I mean, in terms of the leveling up focus, we've got some suggestions about you know, what the tasks might be that we could 
uh, look at uh, together and what, what the key sort of uh, substantial issues are. Obviously, the northeast where we, we now work in uh, has got a particular set of governance problems which are long-standing and which have as yet failed to be resolved. So um, we've got two di very different combined authorities mm. in Teesside and uh, north of the Tyne and then a big sort of hole in the donut and uh, we really don't know how things are going to pan out over the next five years in terms of the, the governance arrangements. Hello. Okay, so would you like me to pick up from there? Well, well, what I was going to suggest is, um, could we go back to the full screen, if that'd be all right? Thank you. Um, we, we are running uh, a little bit ahead of schedule, which, which is great. Um, and I just wonder, Peter, would it be okay if we just uh, paused on what we said so far and just ask for any, any questions from anybody on any issues that have been raised so far? That we can make a note of and come back to um, in the in the in the formal question and answer session. So, yeah, good, good uh, idea, Richard. I haven't seen anything come up in the chat yet, but people feel free to to raise questions or put your camera on and raise your hand if you've got a particular query or question for any of the speakers so far. Okay. Um, would anybody like to to raise anything? Can I could I ask somebody from Fuse to say to say if any of what we've talked about so far sort of gels with, with, with what you have been doing inside the FUSE organization. I don't want to steal Peter's thunder for later, but um, does any of this ring, ring uh, a bell with, with, with FUSE activities, any activities you've been involved in? Anybody, Peter, would you like to just kick that off with a, with a couple of thoughts? <laughs> um... Yeah, it, it, it partly steals the thunder from my uh, presentation a bit later, but I think it, it, it relates very clearly to a lot of issues that we're wrestling with within FUSE. Uh, the, the, and um, as Adrian already mentioned, there has been various FUSE contributors, some of the books he, he was referencing where that knowledge base is being d d developed. Uh, so the inequalities agenda, the, 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 the partnering up, the... the um, bringing back the economic and social agenda and, and, and particularly in, in the Northeast, which is particularly hard hit by, by, by austerity and, and now by the pandemic, th th those are, are, are major issues and really impact on how we partner up with local governments. So, so this is an area of concern that we would also like to, to develop further. So it, it, it rings a lot of bells for me of, of all the issues raised by, by yourself, by Adrian and, 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 and John and uh, by, by Joyce. Um, and it's, it's like I say, it's, it's thinking through the agenda, what can we do as organizations to collectively to develop meaningful research in this area to, to, to further the agenda of bringing together um, the social and economic on, 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 on regionalism, on, on developing more effective partnerships across different sectors uh, that provide timely, relevant research evidence to inform practice and, and decision making. Uh, so so it, it, it's just it's to confirm that a lot of what you, you said rings very uh, true and valuable to, to the work we're, we're coming across. But I mean, I will touch upon some of these issues in, in my presentation. OK, well, we're going to go to, to Richard in a minute. He's going to give his, um, his talk um, uh, to, my, to my own group, um, CFP group. Um, perhaps we can uh, come back to you with your introductions uh, immediately after our coffee break. Um, that would be great. OK. OK. Um, and in the question and answer session. Um, over to you, Richard, I guess. Great. Thanks, Richard. That's that's really helpful. And I think that's been really interesting to to, to have that chance to to find out um, about colleagues' interest here as well. So thank you very much for that. So I just want to to maybe pick up on some of those issues and also on, on what Peter was saying as well in terms of how we might link together through research and to start exploring this idea of relationalism and the different angles and the different approaches that it gives us. So particularly in terms of making that link and translating between the academic work and, and, and areas of practice so that we can think about how we create conditions for relational partnering that are, that are evidence informed and, and uh, drawing on our knowledge base, if you like. So Adrian, if you could move on. Great. 
So I'm not going to, to take you through the whole of this slide, but just to say we are building a knowledge base at the moment. And it's very much more to think about how different actors in, in, in different systems are working to, uh, together perhaps to, to work in a more relational way um, and how we might support and encourage that through providing a knowledge base that people can draw on. And there are specific questions there about what people feel relationship relationalism should look like, um, the, the kind of ideal of that, then thinking through what it currently looks like and then seeing where are the gaps between the ideal and the real and uh, how might we sort of work to close them and, and build good practice as, as we go along. So um, that's very much in terms of where we are in terms of the knowledge base. We have got a couple of projects at the moment. So uh, one's underway. Um, it was funded by UKRI as part of the COVID-19 funding programme. Um, it's called Optimising Outcomes from Procurement and Partnering. So we're very, very much focused on local authorities and the way that they're working to optimise outcomes for their communities um, and what challenges COVID-19 has brought for that, but also um, what lessons there are to be learned from the crisis. So we're very much thinking about this uh, uh, holistically. We're working with local authorities and their suppliers uh, in particular, but also thinking about the, the regional level that Joyce and John have spoken about, the central local relations that Joyce and John have hinted at. We've mentioned the role of the voluntary community social enterprise sectors as well. So we're thinking about how are these actors combining during this, or how have they been combining during, during this uh, crisis period? And particularly then starting to explore issues around where is the system leadership coming from? With Joyce and John have talked very, very much about the, the fragmentation of this. So. Um, I think that uh, we need to look into those issues and think through where is their system leadership? Is there any, how, how might we think about system leadership? Um, how is that feed, how are these ideas around optimizing outcomes for communities uh, taking place within uh, the idea of, of place shaping within um, local areas, whether that's local mm -hmm. authority areas or um, the, the, the areas around NHS trusts or, or whether it's around um, the areas defined by combined authorities and so on. We're, we're de definitively starting with outcomes uh, uh, as well, not intervention. So thinking about what are the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve through um, commissioning and procurement uh, and partnering and then building the um, relationships around that. Um, and as part of that, then thinking about who's there, who can we work with and how do we combine capacities in the right ways? Um, and as we do that, what value is being created um, and how do we make sure that we are creating the value we're, we're intending to create, but also that we retain it. So it's not just defining what we want to happen, but it's also making sure we don't lose value as we work through a process of, that, of, of partnering and, and working through, for, for example, the delivery of, of, uh, of contracts through commissioning procurement cycle. We're also looking very carefully about data and data analytics and, and thinking what role data can play in um, helping us to see trends and uh, see issues that arise and help us to understand the extent to which outcomes are being met. Um, and all that's feeding in then to, to the lessons from the crisis, perhaps in terms of future resilience and thinking, how do we take those lessons together and think about uh, incorporating those into in, in important ways building a knowledge base from which we can draw thinking about what we uh, what we've learned and how we might take that forward including thinking about how prepared we might be for the next emergency response um, if if that were to be required and i suppose at, at the back of this we're, we're thinking about a larger project a uh, more sort of foundational project which is about how do we move on to the next generation of commissioning and procurement in terms of being very supportive of these kinds of agendas uh, around system leadership, place shaping, um, working with outcomes and so on. So we're thinking about sort of next gen commissioning procurement or commissioning procurement 2.0. There is a, uh, uh, the, the, there's been a green paper consultation. The Queen's speech has talked about a new uh, bill for um, this area. But there's a lot of detail still to be added about how we would go about this. So we're hoping this project will make a contribution there. Um, so Adrian, if you can just move on to the next one. The, 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 there's a bid that we're currently in the process of putting together as well, which is then thinking 
uh, in more detail about how we would track the system for procurement and partnering for particular functions. Um, and so we, we would very much want to be looking at health and social care functions here, looking at those in um, either uh, different functions in the same locality or the same functions in different localities so that we can compare and really get to, to understand taking a whole systems approach, the policy context here, um, mapping the different flows in interactions and uh, resource transfers and so on, where the gaps are, and trying to then think through how we track the assumptions that, of value generation and where value sometimes gets lost during commissioning um, in terms of the broader agendas around the social determinants of health, um, the SDGs and, and issues around community wealth building uh, in particular, but clearly a, 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 a key role here for us in terms of our understanding of health and social care. If you can move on, Adrian, again. Uh, and the third aspect of, 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 of that we're, we're looking at within CFP at the moment is actually very practical. So in terms of linking through into practice, there are some exemplar projects that uh, are being established again at the moment, where we will also want to be um, looking as they develop to uh, evaluate these formatively and summatively to, to really, again, continue to improve and expand our knowledge base. Um, and they'll be starting explicitly around the principles that that we've talked about in terms of relational uh, relationism and relational standards, um, thinking about how we would pick up and measure the relational dividend and the impact that follows on from that, and maybe thinking about sort of the shifts that, that, that happen during that process, shifts in practices, shifts in people's mindset, perhaps, uh, and if that, if that happens, but also sort of then how that might end up uh, generating a sort of cultural shift to a that's more productive and, and, uh, and responsive in, 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 in relation to the relational agenda. So those are sort of the, some key thoughts about the, the research pro program at the moment. There are, uh, just to say, further projects that, that we're more than able to develop with a large network that we have in terms of researchers. Um, we can be um, responsive to other opportunities. So I think where we see value and where we see uh, we have information coming from our governance structure and the different groups that Richard told, told you about within CFP. We're then able to identify and respond to new opportunities that emerge, as well as having these more proactive uh, research project proposals that, that we're working, working on. And we're also thinking uh, about a, uh, an academic webinar series on relationism and different aspects of that. So that, that is something hopefully that will be developing through the course of the next uh, few months and uh, by, you know, by the end of the year hopefully we will have this webinar series up and running looking at just different elements of this um, and bringing together academic input. So hopefully that's me finished pretty much on time for our break. Peter can I come to you we're running obviously a little bit later than planned but I think that was very helpful. Would you mind just telling um, us now CFP what, what you've been up to? Thank you very much, Richard. Um, great introductions and, and nice to meet everyone and already some, some great issues and questions raised that we can hopefully pick up in the discussion. But just to, as a last presentation, give you a bit of a, an insight into how FUSE is tackling some of these issues, our experience over the last 10 years uh, in, in working collaboratively, particularly with local government and, and where we see that heading next. Um, so next slide, please, Adrian, if you don't mind. And this is really about sort of for, for us as, as a center for public health research in sort of the transition of public health into local government and the challenge that created since sort of 2013. Um, and, and some of these, I mean, preaching to the converters, we, we, we know that, that policymakers can always access the, the, the research that's being produced by, by, by researchers and academic institutions, or they can't understand what, what, what's in that. Um, we know they value different types of evidence uh, above research evidence or tacit knowledge and, and practical wisdom. And that's very much related to the decision-making process in local government being influenced by personal, social, and political processes. And they often then trump what, what's available through, through, through research evidence.
practice. Another big barrier we've come across is that the research time scale is not aligned with policy processes. So as academics, we're brilliant in publishing our research after commission decisions have been taken. So we're, we're missing the boat in a sense. Uh, not helped in, in, in the last decade or more about through austerity uh, and public sector funding cuts and more recently through, through COVID, which means there's, there's, there's less resources available for research and evaluation in, in local governments. Uh, on the plus side, we've seen sort of a renewed focus on prevention and the wide determinants of health. And Adrian already touched upon this in, in, in his books, but being based in local government and having to work with other departments like housing, education and transport gives that wider focus and creates new opportunities for, for research. Next slide, please. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a quick, there's a one slide missing where I sort of talked about FUSE. It introduced FUSE uh, to, to the members of the Center for, for, for Partnering. So we're a Center for translation, for, for translation Research in Public Health. We've been in existence since 2008, uh, been funded uh, by U the UK Clinical Research Collaboration uh, over the last sort of well, up to 2018 and um, are now sort of uh, running on sustainability funding supported by the various universities in few. So it brings together the five Northeast universities and all the public health researchers within those to, to uh, produce world-class research, but really do that collaboratively with our policy and practice partners. Uh, so a lot of our focus is on collaborative working on getting evidence into policy and practice and translational research is a, a, a big plank of that. Um, and how we tackled sort of the issues that I outlined in the previous slide in FUSE, sort of over the years, we developed a model of working uh, to translate our, our research evidence. And that's a sort of four steps that I would quickly like to bring to your attention. Uh, one is sort of starting with the awareness raising. So simply making policy and practice partners aware about the research that is, is, is happening. Um, that is available and what it means for them. And we've sort of got a dedicated comps uh, manager, Mark Welford, who, who's also on the meeting and introduced himself earlier. We've got a very active website and newsletter and social media accounts to, to promote and do a lot of pushing out of sort of the research efforts that we generate within the center. Um, but that's not enough. And then it's, it's looking at sort of the, the, the next step in sort of knowledge sharing. So how do we uh, debate that evidence and make sense of it collaboratively uh, by, by having um, joint meetings, what we call collaborative research meetings, or co-hosted and co-organized policy and practice partners about the topic of their choice that is high on their agenda, but also through, through international conferences. And it, it's really sort of trying to look at what does that evidence means for me locally. And that sort of takes us into the next steps about making evidence fit for purpose. How can we tailor research evidence and localize it in a way that it is usable and relevant for the decision Decision making in local government. Uh, so we've got a dedicated knowledge exchange broker and the Ask Few service that is a rapid response and evaluation service, which I always describe a bit as a, a dating service for setting up dates between policy and practice partners and communities and those academics in, in the universities. And we've already experimented with new models like embedded research posts to, to, to help sort of making evidence fit for purpose. And that brings us to the last step, sort of the supporting the uptake and implementation of that evidence. And that's really all about capacity building, building those long-term relationships by co-producing evidence together and linking up these different knowledge exchange steps effectively to um, continue and maintain those relationships. Next slide, please, Adrian. And what I want is to highlight sort of the underlying principles uh, underneath that knowledge exchange model, because I think they, they relate very well to the relationalism approach for the Center for Partnering. So we acknowledge in, in our way of working that there's multiple types of knowledge that are being used by various stakeholders across different contexts, local authorities, departments, and that to make that and, and that evidence needs to be mobilized effectively into the decision making. And that means sharing expertise across different boundaries, professional, organizational and sectoral boundaries, which in essence is, is a social process. So it requires trusting relationships to be developed, but also to be maintained. So the opportunities for, for not exchange to be actively created and, and fostered over time, and it takes time. Um, acknowledging that sharing is not in itself enough. Academics are usually put a vacation out, go to a conference and that's it. But that's only the first step in, in a model really. And it's then looking at that relationship building, but also in maintaining that by providing ongoing support and capacity building um, in, in knowledge chains, in working in this particular way to foster an understanding of local context and, and how that knowledge can be applied and, and adapted to, to local context. 
and in doing so, finding new ways of producing and using evidence, such as embedded research and, and co-production methods. So that's really sort of what's underlying sort of the model uh, that we operate, we infuse and build up over the last 10 years quite organically. Next slide, please, Adrian. So to give you an example of, of a recent project where we sort of try to apply these principles and that way of working is uh, the, the core project is with the local authority champions of research, which was led by our director, Ashley Adamson, uh, and also with staff, uh, Mandy Cheatham, now in Northumbria, um, Claire Humble, uh, who was in Newcastle Council, uh, and Sam Redgate, uh, and, and various other uh, university partners. And what we try to do is how can we embed a research culture in local government? What, what, what infrastructure do we need to build to, to support that and we received funding from the Health Foundation to do a, a proof of concept study. So we organized a lot of workshop across the county with local authorities to talk about how they use evidence in their commissioning and procurement processes and, and what they how they would like to change that process and improve the use of evidence within that and what we could do in around collaborative working to support that. And what the results of that showed is, is really that there's sort of multiple cultures of evidence use in local authorities, not one way of working with evidence. And it's understanding those different ways and cultures of evidence use across local authorities and within local authorities, recognizing that the pressures on capacity and workload, um, so previous around sort of the, the um, capacity issues and, and public cuts, and, and but also on the plus side, seeing that there is a lot of existing assets within local government, research champions that exist in various roles that, that champion the use of research evidence, have particular research skills, but feel undervalued in, in not being recognized for the skill or able to apply those skills. So it's, it's, it's how can we mobilize these people more, more effectively? And on the other side, how can we make academics more aware of the social, political and financial context of decision making in local government and what that means for the evidence that they co-produce with those partners? Next slide, please. So this result in a number of principles of, of building evidence informed policy and practice in local government, and that started with sort of creating conceptual clarity, defining the problem together, drawing on those multiple types of evidence and perspectives, and being clear what counts as evidence at various stages of that, that commissioning and procurement process. Doing that very much in a sort of a co-production sort of way, where you engage early in dialogue with various partners about the problem and the different types of evidence. And really important, creating sort of a governance structure for that. So creating conversational spaces between different government departments and with external partners like academics, third sector, industry, but where feasible in terms of what that could look like and, and how you can define and the problem and co-produce the evidence within that. And that was all about being flexible. So when you co-design a, a, a process map for that, it, it shouldn't be a detailed roadmap, but more a flexible plan that should be adaptable to uh, changing context and changing situations. Um, while recognizing and developing the assets that are uh, already available in the, the local authority. So it's not a case of academics parachuting in, it's understanding the culture in local government, but also in academia and build an organizational culture that allows to test out ideas, allows people to fail in a sense in testing out, innovating new ways of, of using and creating evidence and applying that to decision-making. Next slide, please. So in terms of what next, what, we, what we're keen to do in FUSE is to develop more, more research on this and particularly around sort of the creating collective spaces for reflection between local government and partners. How can we organize and support that and how can we uh, de develop meaningful research within that and, and use these spaces to co-produce knowledge in, in context while developing new methods for researching and evaluating how these spaces work. So we talked early in presentations about creating the, the social and measuring the, the economic value of partnering and relationalism. So how can you do that effectively? What are good ways of doing this? We, we've tried to do it with social network analysis as a way of proving up that there's, there's other methods and we're very much interested in, in developing those and also build capacity for sustained evidence use in local government by creating an infrastructure within local government with knowledge brokers, but also um, buy out time to spend in, in research environments for fellowships and honorary contracts and the other way around support academics in developing their knowledge mobilization skills through some online training but also embedded research posts that allows them to spend time in local government context to understand what the pressures and structures are for mobilizing that knowledge. Next slide please. Here's some, some reference if you're interested in those projects and the model, I won't linger on those too long. It, it falls to me in, 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 in a, a few minutes just to try and 
summarize um, what what we've um, what we've done. And first of all, I'd like to say this has been really interesting to meet to meet with you. Um, and and in the, in the main, technology permitting uh, to be able to see you. Um, so <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's really good. Um, for, there were there were four or five key things that I think we need to do next, um, following on from this. The first is um, we we've, we've signed our MOU. We have our broad engagement um, uh, rules and principles. I think what um, Peter and I should do now is follow up with sending out the PowerPoint slides, um, giving access to any of the recording if anyone wants that. Um, but but certainly to send out the PowerPoint slides to those who came and those who weren't able to come, but I know still have an interest in this. Um, the next thing I'd like to propose and, and working with Peter, um, I'd, I'd suggest that we put together uh, the idea of the public sector group. Um, and I would like to, if I may adopt for its terms of reference, um, a lot of the methodology and framework that you are already familiar with. Um, I, I mean, I really like the idea of, the, of, of FUSE uh, is very much focused on raising of awareness, um, sharing of knowledge, um, making the evidence fit for purpose, uh, and supporting update and implementation. I mean, those are key key principles that the Centre for Partnering, through its own five principles, you know, would stand behind. So, in a sense, we've already got uh, a framework for the, um, as I'm calling it, uh, the public health um, uh, group. So Peter and I, uh, I'm looking at Peter now to make sure he's happy with this, but we should progress now to um, establish that group uh, and perhaps uh, agree its agenda um, and uh, agree a date for, for a meeting of that and extend an invitation to all those who came today, you know, to, 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 um, to say how they would like to be involved, you know, going, going forward. But it's a tangible thing. We can, we can make it happen. It's very easy then for me um, through the Centre for Partnering to look at the public health group and, and look at the issues that flow from that in the context of the other issues we're dealing with. They all collectively come together in Joyce's group, the regionalism group, they come together in Richard's group, the research group. And of course, there is a public private uh, sector and third sector, importantly, dimension to all of that. The other thing that I think we need to focus on is we're building our relationalism knowledge base. Um, I totally take uh, John's point um, which, he, which he's made is that a lot of the work has already been done, so let's not reinvent the wheel. So I think part of what we've got to understand, and I know Richard shares this, um, you know, that we, we, we are about creating new things and new ideas and new proposals, but we're as much looking at what worked and didn't work. Um, and, and, and that brings me to, to, to the point that I wanted to make, which is we are in the process of setting up exemplars. And these exemplars, um, uh, effectively, uh, for the time being, we'll, we'll, we'll sit on uh, one side will be local government councils, public sector facing organisations um, with their resources and their uh, objectives. Um, most councils uh, today are, are, are short of cash or, or, or some sort of funding. Um, I don't think the government has yet dealt with the next crisis, um, what I call the, the, the trillion the trillion pound crisis, which is going to be just as, if, as, as, as terrible as, as COVID has been. So on one dimension, we're, we're, we're looking at public health, but I don't think we've really got a cohesive way of looking at what the levelling up agenda means, for example. And I think Centre for Partnering and FUSE working together through that uh, methodology, one of the ways of bringing all those interests to, together to align them is, is, is obviously through the creation of this knowledge base. But, but then we have the exemplars, which I've spoken about. So on the one side, client, on the other side, contractor. At the moment, we're, we're focusing in three particular market sectors, um, uh, and, and they are property. Um, property is, 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 is quite a, a, a sort of, um, well, all local authorities have to a greater or lesser degree resources that are called property, and some of them cost a lot of money to hold, and, and, and maybe they're not making as much use of them as they could. We're also exploring um, the idea of infrastructure um, and the difference that relationalism could bring to an infrastructure-based project. Um, uh, and, and we have uh, discussions ongoing. All of this work is being led by Adam um, and he's in, mid middle, he's in the middle of conversations, but I'm sure he would be very happy to talk to anybody who wants to 
think about um, a public health exemplar um, and, and which uh, NHS uh, providers or um, institutions we might talk to in regard to the setting up of such an exemplar. And the purpose of the exemplar is, as I said, to examine on a, on a, on a contractual almost framework, you know, somebody wants something, somebody does something, let's study the difference that doing it relationally would make. Let's study it from the point of view of the dividend that relationalism can generate. Um, so a public health, uh, one or two exemplars would be, would be where we could focus and, and, and start to look at what we've learned already in the setting up of exemplars on the CFP side. Um, so I think it's, it's a, really, a really exciting time. I'm, I'm so pleased that, um, that, that Fuse are joining in with us and it was really good to meet some of the people who are involved in that. Peter, from me to you, um, thank you. Thank you very much again. And I've been told I must finish at 12 o'clock. No, that, that, that's great, Richard. And, and I very much welcome the opportunity to continue the conversation between FUSE Centre for Partnering about how we can further the, the relationalism and, and partnering agenda and identify specific research opportunities within there. And like I said, the example of projects might be a good way to do that, uh, but also having that discussion of how we join up networks uh, across the country, because we all have rich expertise and, and connections in, in this area. How could we join them up the most, make most effective use in mobilizing some of that knowledge and creating that, that that knowledge base. So uh, I very much invite everyone to, to, to be part of that sort of public sector group and, and continue the conversation there and bring, bring examples to, to the table. Uh, so thank you very much really for, for, for joining today. It's, it's been a bit of great, rich and a deep discussion.